This meeting is being recorded. All right, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, this Thursday, March 3rd. Uh, it's uh, time for another uh, interesting set of speakers. I'm really excited about this. We're, we're part of the, of the new district health service committee or subcommittee or team or however you want to call us, but uh, I'm, I'm getting kind of the pro temp chair, I guess, of this committee. I'm very excited to have uh, some interested people, interesting speakers and also interested uh, participants joining us, Rotarians and non-Rotarians. Um, and again, and those of you that are here, I definitely would like to welcome you to uh, join our team just to have interesting talks and, uh, you know, and go going from there. But this week, we're going to be talking about mental health and a lot of the mental health aspects. This is probably the third or fourth uh, uh, talk we've had in the last couple of years since COVID started. And I think, uh, you know, it's kind of time where we're we're definitely hopefully at the tail end of this. And uh, now how do we kind of rebuild and how do we rebuild us mentally as well? You know, I think it's kind of a, something to talk about, not only just talk about the bad side, but maybe the good side of uh, uh, some of the things, optimistic side of uh, where do we go from here? But um, yeah, without further ado, I just wanted to uh, introduce our, our district governor, Sandy Matsui. Thank you very much for joining us as well as our pastors, immediate pastors governor, Naomi Masuno. Um, and uh, if it's okay with uh, Sandy, uh, you, you wanna give a few words and then I could introduce the speakers. Sure. Aloha, everyone. It's so great to have you here today. You know, we've been going through some rough times, right, with this pandemic and all of the stress that life has, has, has brought into our lives. And so what better way to spend a Thursday evening at five o'clock, Kauhana time, than to, you know, take care of some of these stressors that are, that are, that we are encountering. So if you're feeling stressed out, if your kids are stressing at you out, if your spouse is stressing you out, if life is distressing you out, whatever it might be, join us now because we're going to be hearing about some terrific tips to stay mentally healthy and ways in which to relax, something I know that I can really benefit from. So thanks, Dr. James and Naomi. And to those of you who will be presenting, I am looking forward to helping uh, reduce my stress. So thank you, and I turn it back over to you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, our, uh, we have three speakers tonight, and I think uh, three, they're going to be talking on mental health, but on three different um, topics within mental health, and I'm very excited. I'll just kind of go in through the order that I have, maybe not necessarily this particular order, but uh, we have uh, um, Dr. Lynn Goya from the Rotary Club of Milani Sunrise. She's a clinical psychologist in private practice. Next, we have Rick Tabor from uh, the Rotary Club of Honolulu. Uh, he's a mental health professional, also uh, trained in psychology, but also as a counselor. He's been a big advocate for uh, veterans, families, and the elderly. And uh, of note, he's also the president of the Hawaii Pacific Gerontology Society. And uh, last but definitely not least, uh, we have uh, Dr. Bridget Bongard, who's actually a member of the Rotary Club of Maui, also the, uh, the president, I believe, sorry. Uh, and she's also the founder and medical director of the Maui Cancer Wellness Retreats, which is, um, you know, I've kind of done some um, reading up on it since her last talk, and it's actually pretty comprehensive. I'm actually quite um, um, impressed and well as, uh, you know, very excited to actually learn more about what she's going to say here today. Uh, but uh, she's also an internist uh, by training as well as a fellowship trained uh, uh, specialist in integrative medicine. And uh, I think we're just lucky to have her here in Hawaii, but also lucky to have her in Rotary. So without further ado, I kind of will kind of leave it up to, um, let's see who, I guess between, uh, since Lynn's not here, I, I guess we'll start with Rick, if that's okay with you. And then uh, we'll follow up with Bridget. Is Bridget first. Oh, Bridget first, I apologize. So Bridget yeah. first. We're gonna Sorry. end with Rick because people might fall asleep with his relaxation <laughs> techniques. <laughs> I'm just gonna get them all worked up and then I'll help them relax. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Okay, all right, Bridget, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, let me see if I can. I don't know how to make it a smaller screen. I'd like to be able to see and talk with you, but unfortunately, it just looks like it's consuming the whole thing. Um, so this morning, um, I was at a conference on resilience. It's put on by the American Society for Clinical Hypnosis, of which I'm the president. And I thought to myself, this could not come at a better time so that I can give you all up to date information on what's the current thinking for resilience in the psychological community. And so let's start with times of global stress. 
well, obviously COVID, but God, look what's happening in the Ukraine. Look what's happening to supply chains. Look what's happening to prices. Look what's happening. A lot of this has to do with rapid change. We don't have control and also broken expectations. We didn't expect this to happen. We had a different plan than uh, this upheaval of order and the uncertainty in life. So our conscious mind really only absorbs about mm, 10% of what is coming at us. And the subconscious mind is the repository of the other 90%. So how we perceive information and memory is, can you see my cursor going around here pointing to the frontal lobe? I, I think you might need to share screen, you know, that, that green share screen button on the Zoom and then uh, okay. jump on your PowerPoint. How do I, how, okay. So go back Let to the me. PowerPoint window and then uh, if you hit the share content green button. Okay. All right. So, oh, just do window. All right, share. Now let's there see. There we go. It. Did, it, did it want to play? All right. Okay, then um, let me go back to from current slide. It still shows me the whole thing. I don't know how to make it smaller. Uh, you might need um, to go to the, select the window uh, that uh, your PowerPoint is in. Select the window my PowerPoint is in. So I have to escape. Uh, okay. I think the, the best thing to do would be to actually, yeah, uh, hit um, um, stop share screen. And then when you hit share screen, select the window of the PowerPoint. Okay, stop sharing. Mm -hmm. And then go to share screen again, and then select okay. the, uh, the actual box that has the window with the PowerPoint in it. Okay, window. <sighs> so I don't, is it, so, I don't know how to... So right when you hit the share screen button, uh, like a yes, window will pop up and then it'll be like a grid of different windows, right? And then you have to, out of those, you have to select the box that's the PowerPoint. Um, I'm clicking on everything but the dog right now. So I guess we'll go back. This is sad because this is really yeah. limiting. There we go. Thanks, um, Naomi. Get it. Okay, let me cancel. So how did you do? Well, I'll I have to ask you later, but thank you very much. Because um, what I, I do want to be able to uh, disabled share. Okay, so does that mean that I have to, is someone's going to have to click for the next slide because I can't seem to move the slides? Yeah, so just uh, just put your hand up and I'll, I'll advance the screen. Thank you. Go ahead, please. And go ahead, please. Okay, so what I wanted to show you is that the frontal lobe is where we really process that 10% of all the things that are coming in at us and this, the switch that down regulates or turns off the judgment, the um, ca executive capabilities is called the anterior cingulate gyrus. And why would I mention something like this? Because this is influenced by meditation. This is influenced by self-hypnosis. And this is the gear shift to stop the racing mind folks and allow you to access the information that the other 95, the repository of information in the back of the brain that comes in through all the senses and, and contains all of your memory um, past and present and what's created in the present. So I thought you'd like to know that and see that the important piece is that little red dot uh, right in the right between the frontal lobes because that is the gear shift and that is what we can influence with these relaxation exercises and hypnosis and it also regulates the amount of stimulation going to what's called the amygdala which is your fight flight or freeze so we can down regulate that with hypnosis and meditation okay next slide please if we don't, and we just allow the frontal lobe to just worry, 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 and process things where it can't 
see a solution, then what happens is you, you develop chronic stress symptoms because you put out a ton of cortisol out of the adrenal glands. You feel like a rat on a little treadmill or in a cage where you just don't see a solution. There's no way out. You get disrupted sleep patterns. You get emotional distress, poor eating uh, patterns. You lose your attention and focus. Your deep recall and memory drops. The higher the cortisol, the less your memory, by the way because it affects this little place called the hippocampus. Um, so what we want to do is really show you how to throw that switch and stop that frontal lobe from going over and over and over the same patterns that kept you safe in the past, but no longer are pertinent now. Next slide. So the personality has a lot to do with it too. Some people innately are optimists. Some people are innately pessimists, some people are avoidant, and some people are just oppositionally defiant. You know, what the hell? I ordered a cheeseburger. Next. So what creates anxiety? Okay, we have what we have in the way of reality, but the past experiences bleed through if we're not careful. Any PTSD that you may have had, um, let's just say you've had difficulty with uh, lack of supplies or lack of money or uh, change in job and precipitous things happen to your health, or maybe you had cancer in the past, and now it's even more accentuated, what we call complex trauma, or maybe you were a veteran uh, in the past and went to war and had a traumatic incident, and now this looks like a reflection of the same. How do you keep that from bleeding through and influencing your decision making by the frontal lobe, okay? Because remember, the frontal lobe just kind of want to keeps it keeps it the same because that's comfortable and that's how it solved things in the past. But that's not necessarily how we need to solve things in the future. So what this slide really illustrates is that the future, yes, that's another place you could point to, but the future is also uncertain. You know, it's not written in stone. It's being developed and created by our choices now in the present. So this is one of the reasons why meditation, self-hypnosis, um, just sitting back and having a, a cup of coffee um, for 15 minutes. I mean, actually setting your clock, which is what I do on my cell phone, 15 minutes on the timer. And I just sit there and I let my mind go blank and just let everything process so that I can see things more clearly. So that's tip number one, to try and do that twice a day and don't avoid breaks because your brain actually cannot stay on task more than 90 minutes. Everybody's been to school, everybody knows that. It's, it's almost 45 minutes you can't stay on task, right? You have a warm up, then you have your full attention, and then you have a cool down when you don't even have full attention, then your brain needs to rest for 20 minutes. And it cycles through this constantly during the day. So take advantage of that and allow your brain to rest. Next slide. So when we're talking about no matter where you're planted, you can become, you can thrive, you can be resilient. Next slide. And the way to do that, the keys, next slide are to number one, recognize your block. What is it that you're fretting over? What is it that you're grieving over? What is it that keeps you from moving forward? So mindfulness awareness, whether it's a physical thing or an emotional aspect, it needs to be identified. And we need to say, yes, this is what I'm faced with. And then what you need to do, or we can do, and if, and this is really a whole workshop, folks, because what I would usually do is have you take out uh, pencil and paper and we'll work through a process like this. But then what you want to do is say, is this a fear-based thought or is it real? So is this the past bleeding back and all that experience that has set up the alarm system and keeps me stressed and keeps those cortisol levels? Is that really true right now? Or is this just old conditioning? So that's the first separation is to find out exactly what you need to change and what is what you're worried about and what's the reason for it 
and then we'll show you how to change it. Next slide. So this is an old Turkish saying, you never ride the donkey backwards. Because if you're always looking at the past, you're always going to be seeing the past and how you did the past. And you'll never be able to look in the future and create a new, a new, a new future for yourself. Next slide. So what we want to do is we want to replace that old fear. We want to reframe it. Nothing is impossible. So you need to, so we want to list your strengths. What are things that you have that you haven't even thought of that you could use now that you haven't used before? And so by applying those and also looking at what your true needs are, not just what your wants are or what your expectations were, um, those two things help you reestablish and help you replace and reframe what your new outcome is going to be. So what we're really looking at is future orientation. By looking at your strengths and looking at your needs, you can then project what you really can see happening. And this is what we do in hypnosis. Um, or even in meditation or guided visualization. And it's extremely powerful. And that's what we'll do at the end of this session. Next, please. So if you align your expectations with reality, you will never be disappointed. So in other words, what this is saying is that, yes, if, I, if I'm going, I want to win the lottery. Well, you know, is that a reality? No, but if I want to increase the money, coming through, what are the creative ways that I can do that? And how do I do that? And then I start working on that creative process and I change the entire paradigm. It's just for one example. Next. And really only in these uncertain times are there opportunities. And when you talk to cancer patients or people who have gone through the cancer journey or people who have chronic disease, or people who have had their lives upset, there is always a silver lining. There's always something that they turn around and say, you know, that was hell on wheels, but look what I learned. And I'm a different person now. And I really know what I want. And time is precious and I don't waste it. So even with uncertainty and even with all the things that are happening now, there are still ways of reframing it into positive, into a positive future. Next. So the last piece of it is that continue to reinforce this because remember the back of the brain, the subconscious mind, which really rules in the end is uh, is fed by visual, auditory, kinesthetic, which means touch. So find ways in which you continue to reinforce what it is you really see for yourself, what it is you really need, that your strengths, you see yourself doing it, you smell yourself doing it, you look at the clothes you've got on uh, with this new situation, and then it, bec it, it has a tendency to manifest because your brain wants to do what you're seeing. If you project only pessimistic things, well, that's kind of what you'll get because that's what you're reinforcing. So when we reinforce these positive pathways, then things really do begin to change. And this is not just a wishful, fanciful thinking. It's because you are focused on it and you find creative solutions to make it happen. Next. Patience and silence are two powerful energies. Patience makes you mentally strong. Silence makes you emotionally strong. And I love this because having that 15 minutes to process twice a day, could be in the morning, could be in the evening, but I really recommend that you do that and then write me back and let me know how that worked for you. Next. Okay, then this would be the second half of the talk. So on, so it's time for someone else. All right, uh, thank you, Bridget. Any questions from the group? 
Okay, well, hey, all right. Well, thank you, Bridget. Um, you know, I definitely wanted to kind of, uh, you know, the idea of um, patience and silence. I just wish a lot of people would use that on social media these days. Um, mm -hmm. Really quick to respond, right? And uh, right. I'm, I'm just waiting for something like, a, you know, I don't know, I guess there already are bad things that happen because of Facebook, but, uh, you know, comments or whatnot, but I'm just waiting for, uh, you know, certain, uh, I guess there are, never mind. Never, I'll just I'll just be quiet about it. But anyway, moving forward, I, I also did appreciate the uh, the idea of looking back, you know, and the idea of sitting on the donkey backwards because I think that's uh, I just I just had that recently happen to me. You're always kind of focusing all the the negativity and the bad things, and you kind of clouds your uh, where you're going. And, and just like just like the donkey, maybe the analogy is too far for me, but uh, then you don't even realize where you're going because you've already moved X number of feet already on the donkey, and you don't even realize what, right. you know, where you've been. So You'll never see. Donkey. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, you're absolutely right. And, you know, that takes personal training because, you know, we said, well, well this happened to me in the past, so it's going to happen to me now. Well, no, that's not a logical conclusion, quite honestly. And you have the power to interrupt that. And that's that's the piece that I work with patients constantly on. No, what is it you want to create? Some of the other stuff that you had happened to you is out of your control. What is it you want to create now with who you are, with that strong adult that you are, that wise soul that you are? Well, thanks, Bridget. Uh, I definitely appreciate this. We'll definitely share this uh, talk uh, on, um, you know, on, on our little section of the website as well. I think uh, having the re this recording helps quite a bit, especially for a lot of people that weren't able to make the meeting tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, next uh, is, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Lingoya, who's a psych clinical psychologist. And I think, uh, you know, she just joined us. I see you're there. And, um, you know, if, uh, Linda, do you happen to have any slides you'd like to share as well? Uh, I'll just let you go ahead and um, uh, share a screen if you want to. Okay. I do have some slides, so I'll share screen. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk about COVID. COVID's effects on adults and children. Um, but first I'm gonna start with the effects on children. Okay, let me just close this part of here, okay. So everybody or many people do not deal well with ambiguity. Like if somebody has found something suspicious about their body, they're worried about their health and they go to the doctor, they're not so worried about their health, but they want a diagnosis. Like, tell me what the, the answer is. And once they know that, then they feel a little better about being sick. It's kind of um, ironic that, that that's true, but many people don't do well with ambiguity but especially children have difficulty with ambiguity because it's the feeling of security is such a part of their development. Um, it's related to this theory called attachment where children who are securely attached to parents, you can tell when they're toddlers, um, you walk into another room and your, your little child is in another room and then they have to see you in the next room and then they can run off by themselves. And that's secure attachment. But insecure is when you cannot, they can't leave your sight. You, I'm sorry, you can't leave their sight. They have to see you, they have to be with you. So once COVID hit, kids had, very little security or stability in their life. When will I be go back? When will I be able to go back to school? Or even if, will that ever happen again? When will they be able to see their friends again? And for so many of my patients who were children, they were so afraid that their parents would get sick and die, even yeah. if their parents didn't work in healthcare. Um, because in the beginning, parents went to work. It wasn't a lot of um, virtual working. Uh, there was a lot of anxiety caused by that ambiguity. So these 
are and worse um, anxiety symptoms to be concerned about. If your child is cries very easily or is very easily tearful, a clinginess, um, again, that inability to be independent, isolating themselves. So this is over and above normal behavior. So even if your teenager typically isolates themselves in their bedroom, this is a change in behavior. So it's more isolation. Excessive worry about many different things, about school, about friends, about family. And it's excessive worry that the child doesn't seem able to control. You know, no matter how many times you would tell them, you know, don't worry about that. Everything is going to be okay. They just can't seem to control the worry. Stomach aches that are unexplainable. Maybe the child has gone to the doctor, but the doctor can't find anything wrong with the child, but stomach aches don't go away. Or they always happen just before the, like in the morning before the child goes to school. Irritability. So again, this is irritability over and above a teenager's typical irritability. <laughs> um, then insomnia or hypersomnia. And again, this is like a teenager's sleeping even more than is typical of, of a teenager, where they have no energy or motivation or drive to get out of bed. It's not just a, a laziness. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of my patients, a few of my patients. Okay, so Adriana was a fifth grader. She moved, her family moved to Hawaii from the mainland in 2019. On the mainland, she was a leader in school. So she was on the student council. She, she was very, very popular very likable girl. And when she moved here, she had a hard time making friends. She was just beginning to get into um, a friend group and then COVID hit. Um, her parent was very, very cautious about COVID. Um, I thought, a little bit too cautious, a little bit too paranoid and really, really afraid of it. And the mother would often talk to her husband about her fears in front of the kids. So Adriana got really, really anxious about getting sick and about her parents or her family getting sick. Um, in addition, she... Um, had to take care of her younger siblings a lot. She had a lot of responsibilities at home. And so during COVID, because of her mother's cautiousness, she and her siblings did not leave the house for almost eight months. Um, all they could do was go into their backyard to play. She had only friends on the mainland that she would FaceTime, but she had no friends here. So she was totally isolated. Um, she was very, very anxious when I, when I first saw her. Okay, Jamie, sorry. Hey, sorry, I don't know how to move the, the pie pieces. Uh, Jamie was a middle, middle schooler and she was bullied in elementary school. She's now in um, eighth grade. So just starting, well, in the middle of middle school, she had a little bit of gender identity. She was in the middle of a gender identity crisis. Um, and she always had a feeling of being a little bit different from the other kids. She was an only child, so she got a lot of, actually too much attention from her, from her mother, who was kind of a helicopter parent, mm -hmm. um, which 
which was a little bit too much during COVID and being cooped up at home. Um, sorry, I really don't mean to blame, blame parents. My point is that parents really make a huge, huge impact on their child without really intending to. Uh, okay, Sarah was a fourth grader, always was very, very quiet and shy. But once COVID hit, she withdrew even more and began to have social anxiety kinds of behaviors. She wouldn't talk around um, even her extended family. She would cling to her mom. Um, so all these kids had anxiety. Brian, on the other hand, had depression. He was nine years old always kind of a quiet boy but when I talked to him on in a virtual in virtual sessions when I first saw him he had totally flat what we call flat effect where mm -hmm. you know it's like talking to a teenager sometimes where they they have no emotion on their face and you're trying to get a rise out of them or a smile but he had no emotion, he was just kind of a robot. Um, he was nine years old, but he had suicidal thoughts and a plan. Um, he had, he lived in a two-story house with, an, with extended family who didn't get along. So there was a lot of tension and conflict when everybody was cooped up at home during COVID. So he was only nine years old and he is the only patient who is so young that I ever referred to a psychiatrist because I could not, talk therapy did not work with him. And I found out that depression ran in his family and miraculously, uh, antidepressants worked on him. It was really a significant improvement with medication, even though he's so young. Normally, I would not have referred, I, I don't refer kids that young to a psychiatrist. These are possible solutions. Okay, so what I did with I was book solid last year with kids with anxiety and depression. And the main problem that I saw that they had because of COVID was that they were isolated and they had very little social contact with other kids their age. So I did virtual bingo with them. And so that's when I figured out how to do Zoom. <laughs> and I bought a bingo game and sent them out bingo cards. And we had six kids at one time at one point, all playing bingo from home. And they would, each time we played, they would take turns being bingo master. Um, and one time we had a silly hat bingo, but they had to come to the bingo game with a hat that they made. So it was really kind of fun. And they had a chance to interact with other kids their age. Okay, so first of all, what I did with them was listen. And listening didn't help a whole lot because what they did need was social interaction. So I did that with bingo. But for home remedies of, if you know someone who has anxiety or depression, I would give them the op opportunity to talk um, I think the best place for a parent and a child to talk is in the car. So mm. take your child for a ride, go, for, go around the island and stop for lunch at a shrimp truck. Because in a car, a child doesn't have to look into your eyes and talk to you about really difficult stuff. They can look out the window, you're not looking at them, and you're, you're just giving them the space to talk. Be physically active. That's a really, really good home remedy 
for depression um, particularly, but it's also a good time to be together with your child or your friend, whoever has anxiety or depression. Family togetherness, play um, board games or watch movies together. Um, I have some suggestions of my favorites, like this, these are family movies. Shang-Chi, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. If you haven't seen that movie, that movie is so excellent for kids. Um, for older kids, Ted Lasso. If you've never watched that, it is a great series. It, it's a comedy and a drama. And it's really not as superficial as I thought it would be. It's, it's very touching and very funny. Or go hiking with them. Encourage them to join a club in school. Join uh, Boy Scouts, the band, Japanese club. Um, I'm personally going to try to start early act clubs, which are like interact clubs, but at the elementary school level, because I really wished there was something at elementary schools that I could refer my patients to. Have play dates, of course. Um, and, you know, I'm kind of biased, get a pet. A pet is a great, great companion for a child, a great way to boost their self-esteem, their sense of responsibility, and a great um, confidant even for them. Now, I'm sorry, quickly, um, in about the 32 patients I had le last, let's say when I was the busiest, I think only two of them were adults. Very few adults yeah. came to therapy during COVID. One had long COVID and one had anxiety. That really surprised, surprised me. And I think the reason why I didn't see a lot of adults was they were so busy taking care of their kids and working and trying to maintain some sense of normalcy. And they were so overwhelmed that they didn't have time to seek help. Mm -hmm. Okay, when to seek help. When to seek help is, I'm sorry, one more when symptoms are interfering with a person's quality of life, when somebody's anxiety is preventing them from leaving their house or interacting with other people, or that their depression is making them not wanna get out of bed, not wanna take a shower, they're not eating, um, they're isolating themselves, yeah? When you see it impacting their quality of life is when you need to seek help. Or even before that, you don't have to wait till then. Okay, I'm sorry. So these are some resources. Ask for, ask your friends for a therapist that they know that they would recommend. It's always easier to call somebody and say, you know, I was referred to you by this person. Sometimes a therapist will be more um, open to taking you because of that. You can go to the Hawaii Psychological Association website and search for a therapist using search criteria like um, social anxiety, um, depression in children, and by ge uh, geographic location also, and insurance also. The crisis line is a really good good reference, a good point. So let's say you have a crisis at home. Your teenager is um, talking about suicide. They're really, really depressed and you are at your wits end and you don't know what to do. You don't know whether you should call an ambulance, call the police, you can call the crisis line and somebody will talk to you, a trained person will talk to you 
and tell you, help you with what you do. And they will talk to the person too, but they'll help you. Okay, and then there's my email. You can always email me if you have any questions and you know, I will try to help. So last, of, I just wanna leave you with this, that we'll get through this, you know, and we're, we're almost at the end, I think, end of this really um, drastic phase of it. I think we're over the worst of it. So we made it, yeah, it's gonna get better. Okay. Any questions? That's really nice. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Lynn, I just want to say that you're absolutely spot on. Um, the information that I have read is that um, there's been a, almost a 40% increase in anxiety and depression in, in children and an increase in suicide rate, particularly among yeah. young, young girls. And so I think what you're bringing is so powerful because people need to be aware of that and they need to, they just can't let it, they can't let it go because yeah. when people become anxious, 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 they see no way out, then they slide into depression. And when yeah. they can see no way out, mm -hmm. then all mm -hmm. they see is pain and they don't see other options. That's why I was talking about future orientation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and the importance of that positive social psychology, because if they don't see a way out, all they see is more pain. And mm -hmm. that's when they commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to say, though, that kids are much better now that they are back in school. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they are much better. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Um, so, see, there any other questions? Any? Just as we mentioned, uh, you know, these are some great talks. I'm, I'm, I'm like super excited to um, move forward also with uh, Rick's talk. I uh, just want to make sure everyone is ready for some relaxation. And, um, you know, I definitely uh, met uh, Rick more so on uh, lately with, um, you know, after, after the COVID, uh, you know, started, but, uh, you know, it's really cool to follow him on Facebook. He definitely has a really cool uh, dog and I'm looking forward to, I'm sure his dog provides relaxation, but I'm sure this presentation will as well. Thanks. So we got that dog in April. So my wife wanted a dog for, Sandy knows this, for 27 years. And I said, we'd have to wait till we moved to Hawaii and retired, and COVID kind of retired us, so we got a dog. Um, she just went off to walk the dog because the dog was barking, so we got the dog out of here so I could do relaxation without the dog barking. <laughs> um, so I have a, I put in the chat a um, link to um, a recent rendition of my relaxation exercise that I've been using since like the 1990s. And I originally put this relaxation um, it was a cassette actually originally, because I was doing work with somebody with cerebral palsy. I worked with developmentally disabled, cognitive disabilities, mental health, a uh, whole range of things, uh, terminally ill. I did the mental health liaison with uh, primary care physicians in Seattle. And so I put this together, primarily for the, to, for the person with the cerebral palsy, because he was bedridden and he was a senior in high school. He was having like, I mean, I, I'm not kidding, upwards of 30 seizures a day. And the mother actually was head nurse for, for, uh, for a place uh, in Seattle that uh, noticed that when I would talk with him and I would leave, he, he wouldn't have seizures for a number of hours afterwards because it's very calming. I very much met him where his needs were. We talked story. It was very relaxing. And so I put this together. Um, there's a whole lot that went into it. I don't have much time to do all of that, but I put it together as a cassette and it took on diff different form as, as, as the years went on. So it's been used in group therapy. It's been used for individual therapy. Um, I was having a tooth pull. I was going to have an implant and I was on the way to the dentist, which, you know, like nobody likes the dentist. Yeah. And I put my music on. It was just a random shuffle and the relaxation exercise came on. And when I went in, I took my blood pressure. It's the lowest my blood pressure had ever been. <laughs> it's a very stressful situation. So I use it myself. 
So this picture here is, uh, this is on the Olympic Peninsula. This is actually Lake Crescent, uh, a Crescent Lake. Uh, we'd go there every summer when we lived in the Seattle area. My wife is local grown. We just moved back a little while ago. And this hey, is like Rick? the most relaxing scene I could, yep. Can you hey, hear Rick? me? Uh, I I, I know where Crescent Lake is, and I can imagine it, but unfortunately, I don't think you're sharing screen right now. I'm not sharing screen. Yeah, are you? Well, you? You are. Never mind. I apologize. My my screen is screwed up somehow. I apologize. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm, ruining, I'm ruining. I'm ruining. I'm ruining the relaxation. I apologize. I'll, I'll not at up. all. <laughs> Got started. First, you got to get them built up. You know, worked up, and then we relax them. <laughs> this is the most relaxing scene I would I would see every summer. There's many. We're lucky we live in Hawaii. We can watch sunsets and sunrises. I took my puppy to see a sunrise not too long ago. You probably saw that on Facebook. That was like one of the best things I've ever done. It was at Bellows Beach. I'll definitely go back. Um, okay, so I'm just going to get rolling here. I'm going to fly through some of these. Um, so we mentioned breathing. We mentioned um, how the brain actually does need oxygen to kind of think clearly. So breathe, love, honor, cherish. Meditation is very important. So meditation brings wisdom. This is this is Crescent Lake again, actually. This is my wife sitting at um, Crescent Lake. Uh, so what we're going to do is a guided progressive relaxation exercise today. That's what we're going to wrap up with. We're going to get comfortable. I'll just walk you through the steps and then we'll just do this. We're going to get comfortable. We're going to close your eyes. Let your mind go blank. Concentrate on slowing your breathing. It's just what Bridget was talking about. You're going to clear your mind. And then I actually add muscle relaxation. And again, that's because I worked with a number of um, clients that had uh, terminal illness. I'm all banged up from seven letters in high school, football and things like that. So muscle relaxation, because we store our tension in different parts of the body. And so I'm just going to do a couple areas of muscle relaxation just because of the time frame we have. One would be, so we go th I go through the entire body, kind of the chakras, if you will, cover them. So we'll start with the feet, and I work our way all the way up to the, the head. And one thing I'll show you is we, so just, we'll, we'll clench like our fists, and I'll actually say that. So we'll tighten our hands as tight as we can stand them as we're breathing in. And then we're going to exhale, and we're going to release the tension from our hands and release the stress as we let go. So we'll just do two muscle regions just for sake of time. And then we move into imagery. That's what we'll wrap up with. And at the end of the imagery, I'm going to have you say to yourself, so this is the guided part, I feel relaxed and ready to continue my day. And then you'll open up your eyes and you'll smile. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. So if you're ready, we're just going to close our eyes. Get comfortable. Kind of unwind. Let your mind go blank as you breathe in. And breathe out. And what we're going to do is, we, if you're comfortable, breathe in through your nose, fill your abdomen, and then exhale, breathing out through your mouth. So we're going to breathe in and out. And as we're breathing in, and out. We'll let our minds go blank as we're breathing in. And out. We'll just focus on slowing our breathing as we breathe in. And out. And you can go at your own cadence as you breathe in and out. And the idea is just to slow our breathing as we breathe in and out. Just feel our body relax as we breathe in and out. And just find a comfortable cadence as you breathe in and out. 
And as you're breathing in and out, let's tighten our feet. Just squish your toes and your feet, to the bottoms of your feet, your whole feet. Squish them together just as tight as you can stand them as you're breathing in. And hold it for a second. And then release the tension as you breathe out. Imagine all your tension leaving through those relaxed feet as you're breathing in and out. The next, since we're down in our feet area, let's go to our calf and tighten our calf between our knees and our ankles. Just tighten your calves as tight as you can stand them without hurting. Just hold them tighter, tighter, just as tight as you can stand them. And then when you're ready, release the tension as you breathe out. And imagine all the stress leaving through your calf muscles as you breathe in. And out. And then we're just going to skip a few muscle regions. Just make a fist. Make a fist with your hands. Squeeze it tighter, tighter, as tight as you can stand it. And when you're ready, open your fist and release all the tension as you breathe out. Just exhale as you breathe in. And out. Now we'll do each muscle reason, but what we'll do here now is we'll continue to breathe in and out. And while you're breathing in and out, imagine yourself in a relaxing place as you breathe in. And out. See yourself in that relaxing place as you breathe in. And out. Feel yourself in that relaxing place as you're breathing in. And out. Notice your surroundings. What are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are you smelling in this relaxed place as you breathe in and out? Just feel relaxed in your relaxed place as you breathe in and out. to be in this relaxing place. Continue to breathe in and out for as long as you like as you're breathing in and out. Then when you're ready for breathing in and out, slowly open your eyes as you say to yourself, I feel relaxed and ready to continue my day as you breathe in and out. Well, we've learned many things from relaxation. Um, sometimes if you're in a safe enough place and you just close your eyes, you're naturally going to breathe. And sometimes you can't close your eyes. You might be in traffic. But if you do the breathing, your body will relax. But Bridget was talking about changing the mindset sometimes is, is also very important, very helpful. This here, though, this exercise is just freeing your mind of all your thoughts and allowing your body 
to relax. It's like, uh, it's just, and we recommend you do this. Well, I would recommend it a couple times a day at least. So if like uh, um, kids that had a lot of anxiety, we do it in the morning before they went to school. We do it after school. We do it also again before going to bed. Some other things we do with this, with guided imagery is we can also change the story. So there may be something stressful that's happened or I, here's a great example. Seniors in, in Seattle would do a trip to a camp in Maui at, at the end of their senior year. And I had an autistic gentleman that was terrified to fly, but he really wanted to go with his friends to Maui. And so we would just do stage by stage. We'd go shopping for the clothes, we'd pack the clothes. I mean, every week we'd add something to it. I got really lucky. One of his relatives actually was a pilot this is before, of course, 9-11, was able to have, actually have us go on the plane. <laughs> the relaxation on the plane. He actually successfully did the trip. It was remarkable uh, what, what happened. I had a few months to actually prepare him for it. Um, but we can do it with a number of things, um, just guided imagery. Um, I first learned this, actually, uh, we were doing biofeedback. So I was a petty officer in charge of the mental health clinic over at Kaneohe Marine Corps Air Station when I was a field medical foreman. And I just stumbled into the job. I mean, I, I was doing Psych 101 at Chaminade, and I was doing a research, and I interviewed the psych tech and the commander at Pearl Harbor, at, 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 well, at uh, Kaneohe. And at the end of the interview, the psych tech leaned forward and said, hey, I'm being discharged next week. Do you want the job? They slapped, my chief slapped me on the back, and I was in charge of the mental health clinic. So I started, <laughs> that's why I can say I did it for 46 years, and I've been doing mental health. Um, <laughs> and they, they got a biofeedback machine. And that's where we started to learn these steps. And the Mitzi Simonelli actually had um, um, we had remarkable people come in that kind of taught us well-being. And so I was very young when I learned this stuff. And I've been using it, I mean, really all of my life. Um, so we just relax our body, uh, relax your body. And, and oh, my PowerPoint, my PowerPoint went down. OK, <laughs> anyway, I had that picture there. Any questions or any comments? really nice. So I've been doing this with the Rotary for the past few months. And I'm going to tell you, I told Sandy this, I did it with the Riley kids also. Nobody's ever fallen asleep until I did it with the Rotary. And it's because there's so many type A folks that really need to relax. And it's, it's oftentimes the Sunrise group that's up at like 7.15 in the morning and haven't had their coffee yet. <laughs> so, but typically, folks get energized from doing this exercise. So. There you have it. Um, do take the, um, the PowerPoint, uh, I'm sorry, the um, YouTube uh, link that I put on there. That's actually, we took, um, um, Dr. Warren Wong is doing uh, relaxation, is doing a lot of wellness stuff with seniors, with Eric Kapuna here. And he was in one of my trainings where, where I was doing with, uh, it was uh, uh, Dementia in the Family a workshop and I was doing this and he loved it. So we, we tried to record it, but I was using Stephen Helpram's Spectrum Suite for the music in the background. And his team felt that we had to, and, and they were right, we have to have uh, Stephen's permission. So we actually contacted Stephen and I thought we were going to get the permission. He actually asked me to upgrade the, the quality of the sound because it was very old what I had recorded. Uh, what happened is he actually remastered Spectrum Suite. So there's a brand new 2021 <laughs> remastered Spectrum Suite. We never gave us permission. So we had to take that off. And what we did instead is I put my pictures on there and it's just my voice. Originally, when I recorded this, it was it was really meant to be a teaching tool. I had a cassette, so it was 45 minutes with Spectrum Suite and me doing this for about 20 minutes, walking through the whole, the whole. And then the flip side is just the music, because I thought people would get tired of my voice and they would want to just do it on their own. But I found that most people still want to hear the voice, even adolescents. I did a group of really catty, uh, uh, 12 and 13, 14 year old girls. And every week they'd come in, they want me to start with the relaxation exercise. So our group always started with that. So um, thanks, thanks, take, Rick. take it and use it. You're welcome. Thanks, Rick, okay. for your uh, link. And people can use that. And uh, we, we wanted to bring you the resources that Lynn shared, because if you have people in your club or family and friends around you that may have those symptoms, that you could help them by referring them or help them by doing the 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 um, suggestions that Lynn had or doing the relaxation 
uh, technique that uh, Rick had. Um, we're out of time, so I'm sorry, uh, Bridget, you're mirroring hands. We, do, we didn't have time. And maybe if you want to stay on and record that, we can add that to our uh, the, the recorded PowerPoint. But OK, so we see that Lee is still up, and she did her heart. So thanks, Lee. I guess that for, that's for you, Rick. So thank you very much. Uh, James, you want to wrap us up? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. I uh, definitely want to specifically thank uh, Bridget, uh, Lynn, and Rick. Uh, this is absolutely amazing. Uh, I think uh, we definitely need to, uh, again, just like, uh, you know, if if any of the clubs actually have a, you know, a little window of time, um, they could uh, maybe even just share one of these videos during their club meetings even, you know, and I think that might be helpful you know, just divide the, the three different sections and maybe it's something we could package together for some of the clubs to use as content for their meetings. Um, uh, next, um, uh, I think, is it, I'm sorry, I don't remember the date. I know it's a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, but uh, we do have a, another speaker, uh, uh, Paul Moroz. Um, I'm hoping he'll be able to speak. Um, he's um, a very busy man. He's a, 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 um, a Harvard trained uh, pediatric orthopedic spine surgeon at Shriners, mm -hmm. probably one of the most self-specialized guys I've ever met, but he's also Ukrainian. And uh, he grew Ooh. up in uh, um, Ukraine and immigrated to Canada. And then, uh, uh, and uh, we were actually look, lucky to meet his uh, two brothers who are Ukrainian, also have Ukrainian wives. Um, and, um, and he's considering actually going to Poland to work uh, in a hospital. So hopefully he'll be there, but mm -hmm. his talk is very, is very um, uh, um, fitting, I guess, for travel. Cause he's gonna talk about in-flight and uh, kind of flight emergencies and things to look out for. So maybe he maybe he'll be able to still give us the talk, but uh, that's in store. And uh, again, thank you for joining us all, and uh, we're definitely looking forward to it. April seventh at five p.m. Uh, Naomi, thank you for the reminder. Uh, and uh, hopefully, and again, these talks will be recorded, are recorded, and we'll be able to put them up. So please uh, share them with uh, friends and your club as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And Bridget, if you want to do your um, your hands, you want to do that now. We can add it to the recording. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, this is a, a technique developed by um, Dr. Ernie Rossi and Richard Hell. And what it is, is basically, you can use this for pain control. You can also use this for coming up with new solutions. Uh, yes, that's the book by Hill and Rossi. It, it's, it's excellent. Um, and so we can go ahead and take that slide off because I'll show you how to do it. So basically what I would like for you to do, those of you who want to remain here, is just to put your feet on the floor, feel your seat in the chair, and breathe in and out with your feet on the floor and your seat in the chair comfortably Breathing in and out. And this time, breathe in and out on your own, but extend your hands, your left and your right hands gently in front of you with the palms up. And in your right hand, I would like for you to put your problem whatever it is you can't see a creative solution to with your feet on the floor, your seat in the chair, breathing in and out at your own rate. And with that problem in your hand, taking it out of your body, out of your mind, and holding it in your hand, just let it rest until you can see it and feel it, the weight of it maybe in your hand, all the parameters of that problem. And how it's weighing you down. And you may even be surprised to notice that your hand even drifts downward a little bit from the weight of the problem. And if it needs to rest into your lap, that's fine. Very nice. Very nice. And once that hand is comfortably rested with that problem in it, 
It's your problem just sits there. And now you focus your entire intention on your left hand. And you'll be curious to notice a solution beginning to form in your left hand. Very curious, but the perfect solution just for you, for no one else, but for you. And just allow that solution to fully emanate, fully arise in your left hand. See it, smell it, feel it, breathe it in your left hand. Because in your mind, there's a place, a repository, a guide who sows the seed for the solution to begin to unfold in your life. Might not be this minute, could be a day from now, could be a month from now, but it will unfold in the perfect manner. And your right hand turns upside down, dumping the problem. As this solution rises, and becomes more clear. And whenever you are ready, and before you open your eyes, have the knowledge that the solution is there, and if you can't see it completely, it will continue to unfold day by day, minute by minute. You'll be surprised and curious to see how it does unfold. And in opening your eyes, you continue to let it unfold on its own without you even having to worry about it or think about it. But you might be curious just to enjoy looking at your life differently and seeing how it's changing and unfolding. Very, very good. And whenever you're ready, just come back to the room Move your body around. If you need to, take a drink of whatever you've got there, your coffee, your tea, or whatever. Is everybody back? Everybody feel fully alert? Okay. What, um, what kind of experience did you have? Anybody like to share? I think it was just nice to have permission to let go of the problem and to focus on the solution. So thank you. Yeah, that's part of it. That's true. Good point. Thank you, Rick. As I and move from the problem to the solution, the problem hand was heavy. Then I moved to the solution, and then the solution hand was heavy. Because it was full. Because it moved. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. It's really nice. And it'll be, it'll be quite interesting, too, to see how this unfolds and begins to manifest. Because we see things on different planes. Our consciousness is on different planes. And there's a knowing part of us that knows the solution. It's true, isn't it? 
Yeah. And you can also do this with discomfort. So for instance, when I first learned this from Patterson and Jensen, who were pain experts, and in our in the American Society for Clinical Hypnosis, it was a workshop. And he did that, okay, so you put the pain or the discomfort in this hand, you feel it completely for five minutes, wherever it is. And then on the opposite side, you, you then you totally ignore this hand and you feel the other side of the body, which is totally comfortable. So if you have a headache, you would feel your feet. They're totally comfortable, right? And then you go back to the discomfort side and you feel your head again. And you do that for two or three minutes. And only focus on that, just the discomfort. Just notice it, all the parameters. And then you go to your comfortable feet, your feet are just so comfortable and they're just on the floor and you know just not an ounce of problem there and then you go one minute with the discomfort and one minute with the normalcy so this is actually crossing right left right left side of the brain in addition but it's also de-escalating the sensory motor cortex, so it's not amplified because when you focus on something, it amplifies the pain, all right? So those are the parameters in there, but people were getting rid of headaches or getting rid of back pain. So just by going five minutes, five minutes, three minutes, three minutes, one minute, one minute, but people's pain were going away. And I've used this, um, I had rotator cuff tear and it was like, I was hurting every every was quite a turn. So I did the right, I did the same thing, and surely to goodness, the pain was remark or the discomfort was remarkably diminished. So those are just some things that that you can do. You can use it emotionally, you can use it physically. Um, and it's a very, I find it's a very powerful technique. So I wanted to share it with you. So for stress reduction. If you have anxiety, all the things you're anxious about, now what would it look like to be totally happy, carefree, whatever, what does that look like? Here's your anxiety. Now what would it feel and look like to be totally carefree and the problem is gone? How does that lower the anxiety? You know, that's another way that you can utilize that. Good advice, Bridget. Thank you very much. And, and um, Lee, are you still up? <laughs> She's giving her a thumbs up. Thumbs up? I am. I almost didn't make it twice with the relaxation, but I am <laughs> awake now. Excellent okay. job, everyone. It's something that everybody needs to do. I joined um, a meditation group that's doing a 60-day meditation, and today was day 50 trying to make it a habit. And I noticed today when I didn't do it earlier, my afternoon became so like, you know how when the room spins, if you're sick, only my brain was spinning, not my body. You know what I mean? I felt yeah. a huge difference. So this is great. I'm feeling more equilibriated now. <laughs> well, and Lee, Lee, what you've just said was absolutely true because in one of the earlier slides, we are looking at the anterior cingulate gyrus, which is right behind the frontal lobe. And that is the gear shift that stops the worrying mind. That's so just amazing. I see. And I didn't even realize that. So I really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. And, yeah, it's my pleasure. But that's but it's influenced by head, meditation, hypnosis, and the breathing that Rick taught, the longer mm -hmm. your exhalation, and if you listen to Rick, because I was listening in a professional manner, uh, as well as doing the exercise, but he started with breathe in, breathe out, and then breathe in, breathe out. So he was yes. pacing, he was pacing you for a longer exhalation. So if you will learn to breathe into the count of four and out to the count of 20, that's four breaths a minute, which puts you in theta, which puts you in a hypnotic state, which then shuts down the prefrontal cortex. 
and the judgment and the judgmental mind. And so if you'll do nine counts of that, which is three minutes, mm -hmm. you'll feel a remarkable difference. That's excellent. And, and in some of the ancient cultures, they to to elicit delta waves, which puts you into a deeper state of trance and more access to the unconscious mind and the divinity and more. Um, they would do two breaths a minute. That's what you call the breath of little death because the little death is that of the ego and you become transcendental. So it's seven in, hold for seven, out for seven, hold for seven. And that's two breaths a minute. And you have to work up to that one, believe me. And there's okay. some interesting science, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I think we need thank to you. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Sorry for going on. All good.